I welcome you to my home. Do come in, have a seat. I have something here to relax you. I think you find it quite a treat. If you find me sounding insane, it's just the absolute talking. It's just the absolute Well, welcome back. So, I thought that we would um, take an opportunity here to have a uh, sit down and relax and chat a little bit about a follow-up to a subscriber question that I had uh, uh, just a, a short time ago. Let me start off by saying, man, you guys ask good questions. You uh, you really followed along with this and um, the the questions that you ask now are they're showing that you are starting to think of things in a broader sense. Uh, when I looked initially at um, uh, what was being responded to for the Energy Sovereignty Project, uh, a lot of it was obviously focused very heavily on the design of your own systems. Everything that was uh, going to uh, happen around that. How do you scale a proper system? How do you get these uh, uh, the, these these numbers to make sense? And I, I just was uh, overjoyed to get the feedback from a lot of you that the Energy Sovereignty Project helped you make certain decisions. Maybe the decision was not to go with solar at all. It was. Yeah, too much, uh, too much of a hassle. I, uh, I, I definitely uh, can't blame some of you there for uh, for coming to to that conclusion. But as the energy sovereignty project matured and started to come to its conclusion, I started to notice a change in the questions that were being asked, and the questions then started to branch off into this broader sense, into this community sense, into the sense of, you know, even how, how governments are going to deal with this as, the, uh, as this all expands. Well, Gus had asked a question, I'll put it up here, uh, Gus had asked a question uh, about the inverter and why, if we're using a 7.6 kilowatt inverter, why would the, the utility company have any kind of a, a, any kind of a problem with that? Because the, uh, um, it's limited, right? I mean, it's only 7.6, no matter how much power you put on your roof. Well, the problem with that is, is that, well, not the problem, obviously. Well, the problem for the utility, <laughs> not, the, not the problem for us. But the problem with that from the utility's perspective was that if you do that, you increase the amount of time during the day that you are producing power at an elevated rate. And then that winds up far exceeding what it is that your home uses. And if you have batteries, then you are producing this power for them, but then at night you're not buying power, you're not bringing any power back in, and so the uh, uh, that makes that 20 or whatever it is in your area, that, that grid attachment fee, uh, tougher for them to justify maybe. It's, it's a hard thing, to, uh, uh, hard thing to really kind of uh, um, see what their, what their argument would be on it. But I can tell you that they're in the business to sell power. They are not in the business to pay you for power that you produce as a, I don't know, a subcontractor. What would you even refer to the... Uh, uh, solar producers as. But um, they're, they're in the business to sell power. So this is where the idea of microgrids start to get really interesting. Now, a microgrid, if you can imagine just kind of on a, uh, on a crazy scale, is, would, would be that you and your neighbor have uh, enough roof area that uh, you can combine power your home, uh, both of them, right? And so um, maybe you buy more batteries than he does or whatever, but you connect those two homes and then you decide, well, because you've done that, now you are able then to have total command of your power in summer and winter. And so what do you need the grid for? And so the idea of microgrids then becomes this 
kind of a co-op, if you want to look at it that way, where when you put in a, uh, uh, a subdivision for every so many houses, then you'll have an area maybe in between four houses where the fence line is or at the end of a block on a corner, uh, you will have a small area where you have batteries that then supply a certain number of homes. And we found that uh, uh, in using uh, Tesla's um, power pack, their industrial product that they had on offer again, in 2018, 2019 was the last time we were running these numbers. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and, and do a, a, a dedicated video on vehicle to grid powering and, and, and that kind of a thing later where we'll look at some of the um, more modern offerings from Tesla. But the power packs that they were uh, producing previously would generally be best blocked out in either 60 or 30 homes, depending on which... Uh, one of their uh, uh, products you would use. And again, this to run 60 homes, you're looking at an area that's no larger than uh, oh, what a driveway would be for, uh, for a home. And so we're not talking about a, a, a huge footprint. But now we need to talk about some realities of microgrids. Now, there's nothing that says that this won't work, but the utility companies aren't really going to want to have much to do with this, probably. Now, the reason for that is, is that the power that gets generated by those homes and goes into this microgrid can't be exported very far. In order to export power, the utility companies have to jack up the voltage on the, the power lines. And that's how they're able to lower the resistance and be able to send massive amounts of power for long distances. If you're talking about a microgrid, all that power that's being generated by those solar rooftops, it's stuck. It needs to be consumed locally. And if it's um, not, or if it runs out of power, then the entire uh, 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 subdivision will wind up having to, uh, uh, having to be powered uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the grid. And so they have, again, playing devil's advocate here because it's fair to do that, they have some legitimate concerns about what happens on those cloudy days and you know, when they're actually going to have to, uh, have to power this entire subdivision. Now, where I think the utility argument falls apart is in the fact that, firstly, they know this is coming. It's not like cloudy days are any great mystery. It's not like winter doesn't happen every year, and so the, the, these... These things are things that they can plan for long term. So that's uh, one thing that uh, um, uh, kind of pulls the rug out from underneath their argument. But the other is that if the home has those localized batteries, especially if they have them in the home, if, that's, you know, if you've gone, uh, gone that route, then the demand is never instantaneous. The demand always is a trickle because you're not trying to replace, you're not trying to shoot power in to fill an immediate demand. You're putting power into the system to replace what was used yesterday or over the last couple of days. You've seen the Energy Sovereignty Project. We can go three, four, five, seven days, even, even in winter, uh, we, can, you know, we can go four or five days uh, with a very minimal solar contribution. And so it takes any kind of immediacy out of the equation as far as the utilities are concerned. But we're still back to that thing where if you have a microgrid that is uncontrolled, in other words, unregulated, in, in other words, any, every home can put as much power as they want to on the roof and pump in as much power as they want to to the, uh, uh, to the microgrid, the utility companies aren't going to be sending a lot of power anywhere. And again, these utility companies, they're in the business of selling you power. And this is going to be an uphill battle as far as getting the utilities to accept microgrids. And with vehicle to grid, it could potentially even uh, uh, even get worse. It's, it's going to be really interesting 
to see how the utility companies deal with that. Because the power that you're creating, if you have a third or a half of the homes in any given subdivision creating power, then you've got that kind of a balance point. But once you start to get over that, the utility companies are going to basically have to say, no, we're not going to buy your power. And that's just the, uh, that's just the reality of the microgrid because they're, they're, they're not going to be able to send it long range if it's being generated locally. So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that made sense. And thank you very much for watching these videos. I know we're all kind of here in our living rooms as we try and make the best of social distancing. I hope that all of you are um, successful at that. And, and that you are all healthy. And I want to give a salute to our critical workers, uh, especially the paramedics and those in the medical profession, the uh, police officers that are out there uh, watching over those businesses that are shuttered, uh, and also to those that are in fast food and in the grocery stores. You guys are really helping to show us that we are still in a functional society. There is uh, nothing about this that should cause us any concern. And hopefully we'll be able to get right back out there in the next couple of weeks or a month or so. Thanks for watching.